Okay, let's go, let's have a good show. Hello and welcome once again to the museum's night studio for this week's edition of Inside Media. I'm Frank Bond and I'll be your host this week. This week's program is celebrating Photo Day at the museum and we are pleased to welcome three award-winning photojournalists to speak with us. All have been named winners of the Pictures of the Year International Competition as awarded by the Missouri School of Journalism. In addition, all are also Pulitzer Prize winning photographers. Beginning on my immediate left is Adris Latif, the Freelance Agency Photographer of the Year. He is Chief Photographer in Pakistan for the Reuters News Agency, and he documented the floods that displaced four million Pakistanis in the summer of 2010. Adris has also covered conflicts in other countries, and in 2008, he received the Pulitzer Prize for his dramatic image of a Japanese photographer killed by troops in Myanmar. Next, Newspaper Photographer of the Year, Damon Winter, was on the front lines of two of the year's biggest stories, the war in Afghanistan and the earthquake in Haiti. Staff photographer for the New York Times, Damon won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for feature photography for his coverage of Barack Obama's presidential campaign. And Barbara Davidson of the Los Angeles Times was awarded the 2011 Pulitzer for feature photography for her intimate story of innocent victims trapped in the city's crossfire of deadly gang violence. Barbara's photography in that series also earned her the Community Service Award, the Issue Reporting uh, Story or Picture Story Award, as well as the Feature Picture Story Award in the Pictures of the Year International Competition. Congratulations and welcome to all Thank three you. of them. Thank, Thank you. you. I decided to take a ladies first approach to this, so Barbara, we're going to begin okay. with you. <laughs> I want to find out, first of all, why you decided to work in black and white in your assignment. Why did you feel that black and white images for what you were trying to convey would be the best way to, to connect with the public? Right. Um, well, this piece uh, is really a moment-driven piece. And uh, I think to have successful color images, you really need to be conscientious of using color as part of the composition. And I w wasn't really focusing on that. I was focusing on how people were interacting with each other and, um, you know, like I said, more moment driven. So we stripped away the, co the colors, so you kind of went right to the heart and the soul of the image, which is what we were hoping for. We're going to share these images with the audience. You can take a look at the, uh, <coughs> the monitor there. In each of your photos, uh, each one more heartbreaking than the one before, but as is often the case with photography, the dagger comes when you read the caption so that you understand what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at this first example. These are students from Wilson High School. Tell us why they've gathered. Tell us what happened on the night that they're memorializing here. Uh, Melody Ross was a 16-year-old girl whose uh, parents immigrated from Cambodia. And for the first time, they had allowed her to go out on her own to the homecoming football game. Uh, shortly after the game, there was uh, some gangbangers that uh, were shooting at one another, and she was standing on the street corner with her best friend, waiting for a lift from her parents to go back home, and one of the bullets hit her in the head and killed her instantly uh, at the site near the school. Um, this greatly impacted the community. Um, she was an incredibly sweet uh, girl from what her friends and family have told me, and so it really impacted the school. Uh, this happened in a community that uh, they were well off, this community, and uh, so at this particular photo, um, it's a memorial to her, so all the school and friends gathered. And let's take a look at the next image and, and tell us about these particular students and their connection to Melody. Uh, this is Tori and her friends, but Tori's in the middle, and Tori was with Melody when it happened. Uh, she was standing right beside her, and they've been best friends for years. So Tori now is going to have to live with this for the rest of her life. Her, her life is completely altered watching her best friend die. And not only that, she lives with the guilt of, of wondering why it happened to her and why it happened to Melody and not herself. And here they are watching uh, the coffin of their very close friend being uh, lowered into the ground. This series was, was your idea, Barbara. What did you have in mind? What did you say to your editor? What did you ask for? To, to, to get the assignment that allowed you to, to get close with this situation and for an extended period of time? Um, well, I think this is an issue that happens a lot in our community, and I hadn't seen a comprehensive visual investigation of this issue, and uh, I thought there was some level of um, 
desensitization that was going on in our community. And when the media would cover these stories, it would be a very quick look uh, what happened and, and then coverage of funerals. And uh, we never really looked beyond that and what happened to these families. So I had proposed it to my editors and they suggested that I go out and just find families that I thought could really speak to the issues that were happening in our communities. And that's what I did. So for about six months in between assignments, I would go out, I would research, find the families. I, I wasn't working with a reporter, so I was wearing a, many different hats. I was the investigator, the reporter, the social worker, the photojournalist. And um, then I would bring the images to my editor, Mary Cooney, and we, I would it, you know, uh, introduce her to the families and what their stories were. And uh, we were trying to find a cross range so that you could see it wasn't just happening to one community in one area. So um, you know, they, they grew to know the families through the images, and then they uh, fully committed, and I worked for a long time on it full time. Yeah, the world has indeed become a global village, and it's photojournalists to put yourselves in harm's way, put yourself in the midst of, of calamity and, and grief to report back to us on the human condition. I'd like to move next to you, Idris, uh, because uh, we're going to look at this image from the aftermath of last year's flooding in Pakistan. And as we know, we've seen around the world getting food, assistance, medical supplies to uh, survivors of natural disasters is very difficult. Take a look at this image, and what you need to know is that Idris came and left on that helicopter. So apparently, while you were on that helicopter, you <coughs> decided that the camera needed to be someplace else in order to get the image you want. Tell me about what you did next. Well, um, first I got to Multan because that's where the helicopters were taken off from. So uh, th this is a, a week into the floods and I needed a va vantage point that would show the scale of the disaster. So I thought that was best done from the air. On this particular day on August 7th, the helicopter was, uh, we're, we're moving for about an hour uh, and, and we came across a cemetery where these villagers were gathered. It was the only, only grounds that was, that were, that was uh, above water. And the, hel the pilot started descending, and the crewman slid the door open to, to see if you know, the ground was solid enough to actually land on. And as he slid the door open, I saw the villagers running towards the helicopter. And instantly in my brain, I thought, oh, this picture isn't from inside the helicopter, it's from outside. So I pushed the crewman out of the way, and I leapt out, leapt out onto the ground I think about that time, we were about maybe 10 feet or so off the ground. And as soon as I got off, um, I wanted to show the villagers attacking the helicopter. So I, tried, I started fighting the propeller winds and tried to make distance from the helicopter so I could show the overall image, which was what I was going for, the, the machine above people desperate for food uh, and desperate to get out of uh, the situation that they were in. So I, I fought the winds trying to make distance away and I kept trying to make a frame with my wide angle lens and the helicopter just was, it was too big and I kept getting further and further away and finally I made the moment, captured the moment with, the, with people getting relief supplies. The helicopter came down and as the people attacked it, it started hovering and the crewmen started dropping food supplies down. Um, Within seconds, I knew they were going to take off, so I started heading back towards the helicopter, hoping to get back on. <laughs> and, um, and as I came under the belly of the helicopter, I thought, oh, this is peaceful, because I wasn't being thrown around, and um, I wasn't fighting the winds, and, and, and in front of me, people were latching onto the helicopter. And I ended up photographing a few frames. Uh, another 15 seconds, and in my heart, my heart was pumping, because I wanted to get back on the helicopter before it took off, so shortly after I shot that picture, I, I went around the villagers and made eye contact with the crewman that had opened the door, and he was not happy, and he was telling me, hey, yes, you better get on right now, and um, I went and tapped one of the villagers on the back, because we couldn't communicate, the, the propellers were loud and uh, I asked him for a boost and uh, he turned around and said okay and 
And uh, I put my leg on his hands and everywhere else, I think on his shoulders. <laughs> and, and the crewman grabbed my wrist. I was giving him my hand, but he just pulled my wrist and then just dragged me back into the helicopter. And all right. Do I understand correctly that this man in the white scarf, the, the older man, held on? <laughs> he did not let go. Um, and as the helicopter started, you know, we started flying off. I turned around and there he was. He was adjusting, <laughs> he was adjusting his scarf. And I was like, how did you manage that? I think he hung on long enough <laughs> as we flew off and the crewman just couldn't let, you know, let him hang on and, sure. and ended up pulling him in too. Yeah, wow. What is it about having that camera in your hand that, that you just feel compelled to, to go to where it can make a difference? Well, you know, um, a moment, a still moment uh, can make a, can bring the story to life. Uh, and people around the world, you don't have to read English uh, to understand what's happening. Uh, you know, you could be in Japan or Pakistan or in Africa or anywhere else, uh, not be able to read English and still understand through a picture uh, the story uh, of what's happening. So. As a photographer, you have to understand what you're looking at. You have a little bit of anticipation. Uh, then you act. Let's take a look at this taken during a very chaotic situation where troops in Myanmar turn against a group of protesters. Describe for us exactly what we're looking at in this frame. This is the frame that won you the Pulitzer for breaking news in 2008. That's correct. Um, this is uh, after several, several days of protests by the monks. In, in Burma, and the monks have a huge role in Burma. Uh, and the monks asked the community not to come out and protest, and they, you know, because the, the military would crack down immediately. And because they're such a strong force uh, in Burma, uh, they, they were marching for days and days, and finally the military did crack down on, on September 26th. Uh, all the, they did crack down on the monks in monasteries, and, and the next day the monks didn't come out and protest, and, and the people realized that the monks weren't coming out and something had happened. So finally the people came out on, on September 27th, and they gathered in central Yangon. Um, this is the heart of the city. And uh, I got to the heart of the city about, about 11 o'clock, uh, and normally the monks would protest about starting at noon. And starting at noon, there was about a dozen protesters and, and they were chanting slogans. I, I, I didn't know exactly what they were chanting, but soon other, soon other people started coming out and, and the crowd became, it went from dozens to thousands uh, within an hour. And as the, start, uh, the crowd started gathering, I ended up finding space on a bridge um, because I had, a, I had a feeling in my gut that the military was going to arrive and possibly things were going to go bad. And every 15 minutes I would leave my spot on the bridge and, and head down and um, want to go photograph on the ground with so much going on. But then my gut was telling me, no, stay on this bridge, stay on this bridge. And eventually, within an hour, uh, from the bridge, I could tell there was an endless number of military trucks, trucks approaching us. At this moment, I set my shutter speed to, to stop motion because I had a feeling things were going to go bad and I would have to stop, you know, people running. Um, and as soon as the military trucks got there, uh, immediately they op started opening fire and, and everyone scattered. I mean, you see, an, you see an empty street there, but that was full of thousands of people. <coughs> and this is about, I think, 13 seconds or so after the shooting started. And this is my second frame. Um, for the first 13 seconds of the shooting, I, I, didn't single, I didn't shoot a single frame because people were running away and I, 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 I couldn't see anything to photograph. Um, finally, the corner of my eye to the right, because I was focused on the left people running away, and I, I saw someone falling over. And as soon as, I, as soon as I saw someone falling, moving through the air, I turned my camera to that direction, and I shot four frames of uh, Kenji Nagai on his back. 
soon after that, I put my cam slightly put my camera down, looked around me on the bridge. The bridge was full of hundreds of people, and they were all lying down because there were bullets flying everywhere. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should take cover. <laughs> so, but you know, I took cover, but I'm I'm another layer on top of layers of people already lying down. And then uh, I'm trying to, you know, I want to photograph. My brain's telling me, you need to photograph. And my gut's telling me, get out. You got to get off this bridge. So I start crawling on top of people. And I find another spot. And they're releasing tear gas and grenades. And I, I photograph that, uh, a few more images. And then I get this really you know, deep feeling that I need to just get out of there. So I stand up, and now I'm running on top of people, lying down, and I get to the edge of the bridge. And the, it's a really old bridge that no one, no one had used in years and years, and the steps had cracked. So I uh, ended up jumping off uh, because the military was surrounding the area underneath us and um, jumped off. A protester came, helped pick me up, and I went to a bus stop about 20 meter, meters from where the bridge was, and I looked in the back of my digital camera and, and, and realized that, um, that this person looked like a journalist because he was holding a camera. And I zoomed in, and I saw a gunshot wound. It looked like it was in his stomach. I later found out that it had actually pierced his heart, lower chest. Um, at that stage, I got on the phone. I think that was the last phone call I made because communications were completely cut off after that. Damon Winnewood talked about where to put the camera, where to point the camera, when to squeeze the shutter. Nowadays, with the technology we have, there's also some buzz on the internet about what kind of camera to use, what kind of equipment we're using. I want to go to this next image. You were with a group of soldiers in Afghanistan. And as I understand that you were using your iPhone, uh, and, and there was an app involved. Without getting too technical, tell me about some of the buzz that's popped up on the internet about taking news photography with an iPhone using an app. Um, yeah, I, I, this, this story has generated probably a lot more attention than I ever intended. Um, I think when I set out to do this story, um, this is one feature in a, in a part of a year-long project that we had undertaken to cover one battalion's deployment in Afghanistan over the course of a year. And for this one particular story, um, we had uh, worked out the chance to go on a six-day mission with this one company that we knew very well and we had spent a lot of time with. And um, the interesting thing about doing embeds uh, is the embed is only as good as you sort of make it. So we, we had found that this mission sounded really interesting. Um, they didn't want us to go eventually because they said it's going to be very dangerous. It's going to be really involved. You're going to be sleeping out in the open, um, doing everything that the soldiers do. Um, and we push and push, and they finally allowed us to, to go on it. Um, when we eventually did go on it, um, we sort of got there, and we had been covering this battalion for a year, and we said, well, what is really different about this mission than any other mission that we've been on? And how do we tell this story? How do we make this, this opportunity we have, how do we use it to the best of our ability to further tell this story about what it's like to be deployed? And the reporter and I talked about it for a few days as we were there. And we came to the conclusion that, that life out with the grunts, you know, the, the basic infantry level soldier, is almost like a sleepover camp. Uh, it's almost like um, summer camp with guns. <laughs> it sort of felt like, you know, the, there's a lot of waiting around, there's a lot of joking. Um, it's not really what you would expect it to be. There, there are intense moments of fighting, but um, it's really much more mundane than you would ever imagine. And I started taking pictures just for fun with my camera, um, with uh, my, the phone in my camera. The camera, camera in my phone, phone <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> using an application that allows you to shoot square, which is a format that, that I really like, and I, I shoot um, on a film camera sometimes. And um, the more I took pictures with my phone, um, the more I realized that the soldiers were really unguarded when I, when I was taking photos with, with this phone. And, um, and I was taking photos in a way that was really casual and very fluid, um, and I was attracted to photos that I wouldn't necessarily be attracted to with my regular camera, and I had it with me the whole time. 
um, but I would, I would focus on little details and little things that told the story in a very different way. And by midway through this mission, the reporter and I agreed that this is actually the way to go for the story. And um, when it was all published, um, if people that had criticized the photographs and their use of the phone, if they'd actually taken the time to read the story, they would have realized how well those photos meshed with the story that was written to really give a complete picture of what those six days were like for those guys. And um, you know, at the end, I went back to Afghanistan for my third and final trip. And uh, one of the soldiers, uh, specialist Christian Dupree, um, there's a photo of him with a friend, and they're, list they're sharing the headphones on an iPod, um, just in a sort of a quiet moment and laughing together. And he, he said, I saw those photos that you took. I, I, like, he said, I think they you took them with your phone. Um, he's like, I don't know what, a, what it was about them. They were kind of weird. They were sort of dirty looking and dark. Um, but when we saw those photos, those photos looked exactly like we felt over those six days. And to me, that was the greatest compliment. Mm. You know, it's interesting, and, and I picked this particular image because you had photos that you took out on patrol and this, that, and the other. But, mm -hmm. but th this, I believe, you know, shows kind of the, the intimacy, the, the comfort with which you right. know, they gave you that sort of access. I'm also reminded here that you know, beginning with the Iraq War, because of the technology, you know, this generation has seen war zones as captured by the soldiers themselves with right. iPhones and that sort of thing. How has that sort of user-generated material getting into not only you know, newspapers, but more often onto the web, either through their blogs or through news organizations that take user-generated content. How has that impacted your work, your, the, the environment of the photojournalist? I mean, it's interesting that you ask that because the, this project, um, A Year at War, uh, we actually have a whole dedicated section that is strictly for user-generated content. So in addition to all the pieces that we're producing, all the multimedia and photography, um, we have a whole separate section that mainly we were hoping that soldiers uh, and their families would sub submit material that um, could help to tell a more complete picture. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about user-generated content competing with the work that professional photojournalists do. Um, and yes, everyone does, a, does have a camera. Um, I don't think it precludes the work that we do, though. Um, and I, you know, I'm always going to say that because I always want to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is something to, um, I, I guess, to be concerned with because uh, increasingly there are cameras at every single event, and you know, often on spot news, the person who is there with the camera is the one is the one that's going to get a shot, whether it's good or not, whether the intentions are correct or not, whether there is any bias or, um, you know, preconceptions that that gone it, had gone into making the photo, uh, and papers are. You know, publications are beginning to use those, mm -hmm. and it's you know it is a cause for for concern. I uh, we talked a little bit about the caption giving context to to the material. Uh, I'm looking in the foreground at a, a man <coughs> with tears running down his face. Uh, Barbara showed us some images that that will bring a tear, but but this is different. What what are we looking at here? Um, this is actually the the moment. Uh, this is an election day in 2008, um, and this is the moment where. Uh, over the big jumbotron, they had CNN had just projected uh, Barack Obama as the winner of the presidential election, um, and this is a moment that you know we all, as, as journalists, uh, as people covering the campaign, and all the voters had been anticipating for you know a year, and um, you know I, I remember scanning, uh, scanning the crowd and sort of trying to anticipate who, who had that look on their face, who was really waiting. Um, and a lot of us had found this gentleman, and he had he just instantly broke into tears. And you know, um, I, I remember I, I was giving a speech, uh, an acceptance speech for the Pulitzer that year, and I, I had talked about this picture, and said how lucky I was to have won an award like the Pulitzer. And the only tears in my story were tears of joy, and that was a really uh, a special thing for me. Nice. Well, well, here's one. We heard Idris talk about uh, flood survivors, uh, you know, reaching for supplies. And I'm looking at these hands reaching skyward, but there's no helicopter. <laughs> what put these hands up in the air? Um, well, this is uh, sort of illustrates both uh, the beauty and the curse of covering a presidential campaign. And the curse is uh, repetition. You go to these events, and they're the same thing over and over and over again. The beauty with this picture is that I had gotten to know his speech so well. Um, that I could anticipate, 
I could anticipate how the crowd would react at certain moments in his speech. And um, we had been doing a story, we had been working on a story about his tax plan. Um, and there was a moment in his speech, uh, you know, midway through that I know he would always say, how many of you in the audience make less than $200,000? And of course, the whole, the whole crowd puts their hands up. Even the people that make more than 200000 they put their hands up too. <laughs> they didn't want to be picked out. Right. How could you not put your hand up, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so I, I, there were probably five events in a row, five days in a row, where I had this picture in mind, and I kept trying to make it, and it would never work out. I would either forget to do it, or I'd be in the wrong position, or things just wouldn't work out. But on this one day in this baseball stadium, the layers were there, the light was there, the moment was right, and the next day we actually ran this story on his tax plan, and it, it worked out. Mm -hmm. Barbara, what is it about a still photo that, that has the power to, to evoke an emotional response, a strong emotional response? Well, I think a, a still image, you uh, stare at it for a lot longer, and um, it resonates with you more because you know, video and television, it moves so fast. It doesn't really, I don't think it sinks in as quickly. You know? and, and an image, you stay with it. You stay on it longer. And because of that, I think you have the opportunity to digest what the image is trying to reveal. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Adrice, knowing that in the field, how does that guide you as a photographer as to, to, to what images you're trying to cap, what, what part of the action in front of you gets your attention to, to kind of freeze for us for all time? Well, I think uh, you concentrate on images that have impact. And when you see a moment uh, developing before your eyes that you know will have impact across the world, mm -hmm. then uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite obvious most of the time. I think uh, most people uh, don't realize uh, how many times you have to make a decision about when to photograph, whether to help whether to, to get involved with what's happening right in front of you. Damon, when those moments come, I mean, I'm sure you deal with each one individually. And, and what's that process? Oh, you say the tough questions for me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's always a tricky, um, a tricky thing to navigate um, because often uh, we find ourselves in circumstances where people need help. Um, I mean, I think that was something that you know, I was confronted with all around me in Haiti, uh, as were all of the journalists and, and all the aid workers, everyone who went to Haiti um, to either cover that story or to lend a hand. Um, I always would have to keep in mind that what I can do on an individual basis as a person, um, unless it's a complete dire circumstance, what I can do uh, right there in a practical way is, is sort of pales in comparison, I think, to what I can do if I keep doing my work as a photographer because um, you know, if a picture uh, lands on the front page of the New York Times, millions of people will get to see it. And, and I know um, people said after the coverage of Haiti that um, you know, th th it's their feeling that, that people back home seeing those images were, are moved to, to donate. And I know people donated in record, you know, record amounts of money to help in the, in the relief effort. And I would like to think that what we did helped to make that happen. Adrice, we grew up on photographs. We were taught to take pictures, take pictures, take pictures. What is the, the position of, of, of the still photo, but recreational photography in Pakistan? Is it, is it, has it kind of you know, come up nowadays? You can't buy a device. It used to be you can't buy a device that doesn't have a clock in it. Now you can't buy a device that doesn't have a camera in it. Is, is that becoming true globally? Sure, in, in larger cities in Pakistan like Lahore, Karachi, and Islamabad, that is the case. Mm -hmm. People are using Blackberries and, and iPhones and, and Nokia cameras with, uh, you know, built-in cameras. But uh, across Pakistan, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people still don't understand the image. Uh, it's an invasion of privacy, uh, uh, and they're very conservative, private people. So uh, the camera is still offensive in Pakistan. Barbara, I'm going to ask this of you, but I want responses from all of you. What do you do with your own emotional response? Being, being a news photographer, you, you have to open your eyes and see everything, take it in, respond to it. How do you hold it back, and then when and where do you release it so that when you go out next time, you have not become jaded, you have not had your senses dulled to it? We drink a lot, <laughs> <laughs> an awful lot. Um, 
you know, uh, of course when you do um, the kinds of photography, the, the work we cover, of course, it's physically impossible to be impact, to not be impacted by what you're seeing. And the images that we make, we would never be able to make those images if we had a heart of stone. So we certainly haven't become jaded by it. Um, you know, I, um, a, a lot of people ask me that question, how do you deal with it, how do you deal with it? Um, you know, I'm not effective as a, as a journalist, as a photojournalist, if I am participating in the sadness of what I'm seeing because I'm not able to work. And it's my goal to stay objective and, and try to tell the most powerful story I can tell. Um, it's really important for me to have an emotional response from the readers to my photography because I think it's important to empathize with the people we're covering. Usually when it's social issue stories, that's, what you're that's, what, that's the goal. Um, and then how do we uh, digest it as humans? I don't think you ever really do. I think you lose a part of yourself in every story you tell. And I think, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a part of the deal. You know, you can't do what we do and not be physically and emotionally impacted by what you're covering, especially over years and years and years and years. It's just impossible. Some photographers burn out, they get out of the business. Um, others can cope with it a little bit better and they keep on going. Um, you know, it's that sensibility that fuels them to continue to tell these stories because they recognize how important they are. So I think for every person it's a very different uh, personal experience that I think we're all really kind of private about. Damon, get public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's, I always think it's really sweet because everyone, you know, whenever we do a panel discussion or, or people ask questions from audiences, they always want to know that. They always want to know how we personally deal with it. And I mean, I think part of the things when you witness um, really tragic events, um, really sad situations, uh, in a way it helps to put perspective on your own life. And the things that um, are difficult in your own life, you start thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't be complaining about them or maybe they're not quite as bad as I, I thought they were. Um, and it also, I always just think like, I, I really don't have the right to um, complain about my own comfort or my own emotional you know, situation um, in the face of some of the really tragic things that, I've, that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Dries? You know, um, most of the time the people, the subjects and the stories that we're covering, the, the <coughs> our subjects are actually dealing with a lot more than what we have to deal with. So going back, definitely, it, um, we care about the stories we cover, and it definitely affects you personally. But at the end of the day, I try to go, grow from it. I try to learn myself, uh, my own feelings. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I, I realize that the subjects that we're covering is, are the ones that are actually going through the obstacles and issues. And, and you know, um, so it, it makes it a bit less difficult to deal with, but at the end of the day, it is, it's difficult uh, to, to understand why things happen. At the end of the day, you try to grow from it, and, and, and I try to use it to, um, you know, cover future issues better. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, and I'll speak from a television pr perspective, and I know that television news, when I was doing it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, was a, such a small group of people that if you were on that big story with the big emotional nut right in the middle of it, chances are you were also having reunion with someone <laughs> you were very close with a long time ago. And so at the end of that day, uh, as Barbara said, you go out and you have a drink, but you're talking to somebody about something really important. Joking. I mean, one of the real <laughs> core issues. <laughs> and you're talking to somebody that, that you also have an emotional mm -hmm. stake with. And I know that even when that doesn't happen, you photographers, you, it, it becomes a fraternity where you help each other. You, you, you know that you're out there. So now I want you to help us, and I want each of you to give us one thing that we can do to make our home photography better. It's graduation <laughs> season, it's wedding season, am I right? We've got summer vacation coming <coughs> along, people are gonna be going to the beach, going to the mountains. So, Idris, let's start from you and go the <laughs> other end this time. What, what is the one thing that the course. average person <laughs> yeah, could do that will make their photography better? Well, you know, I, I hate the fact that all cameras have auto and program and custom one, custom two, custom three. I think everyone should be shooting on manual because it takes about <laughs> 10 minutes to really understand your camera. With a digital camera, you can look at what you're photographing and make a few corrections. And, and, and it comes down to your ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. That's three things you have to understand. And I think if you manage that, you can, you can manage 
images is quite easy. Okay, Damon? Um, my advice would be, uh, be the fly on the wall and look for moments because even if you don't know your camera, if, even if you don't know anything about photography, we all can have patience and rather than being the person who needs to get your photo right away and say, you know, pose, give me a big smile, just hang out. Keep your camera, maybe don't even look through the camera, just keep it ready, keep, you know, keep waiting and, and have, have that extra 10 seconds of patience to wait for that perfect moment. Um, I really envy people who take snapshots because I don't do that anymore and I, I, I love that. I love that culture, that snapshot culture because I think those are the most precious photos ever. And um, you know, I would just say take pictures of things that make you happy, just things that you know you feel good, that bring good feelings to yourself. You know, I'm not much of a technical photographer. I know what I'm doing, but it's not really part of my conscience when I'm shooting. Um, I would just say take pictures that make you feel good. Mm -hmm. What makes you craziest about family and friends who have the cameras and, and, and you're at the event? Here you are at the christening. Here you are at the graduation. And you know what they do. I mean, one of them is say cheese, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of funny. I love that culture. I think it's part of our pop culture. I think that's really fun. Because um, uh, I don't, uh, photography for me, that's not my experience with it. So I love that experience. I, I, I love living vicariously through people who are constantly taking snapshots. It's fun for me. I like it. It makes me giggle. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you find that, that, that you get attached to certain images that, that, that you've taken? Do, do you, or, or is your next image the most important? Uh, I, I <laughs> any, of you, any of you. I <laughs> definitely get attached to images. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I get attached to other people's images. Mm -hmm. And uh, they move me. Mm -hmm. They've moved mm -hmm. me since I was a very young boy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and they, they stole my heart at a very early age. And, and that's exactly why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what, what, what I do. Yeah. I think it's, it can be easy for us to associate our own personal experience that we had making an image with the image itself, and sometimes it clouds our judgment. Um, and we think we have a photo that's really terrific, but maybe it's not so terrific. We just remember how <laughs> fun it was or this great experience we had making it. And yeah. sometimes we need somebody to step in, like an editor, to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so editors do serve a purpose. They do. Uh, yes. that, we've made news here today, folks. <laughs> that's <Farmer>. yeah. um, <laughs> well, uh I think our professional photographs, you know, like Damon was saying, I don't think you should really ever love them too much because I think the editing process is critical. And uh, if you love your images too much, you're not thinking clearly about the edit, and the editing process is critical. Uh, you can have a million good images, but if you don't have a good editor, nobody's going to see them. So uh, it's really critical to make sure that you don't love them too much because then you can't see clearly and you can't edit properly. If you're at the royal wedding, what's the money shot? <laughs> I don't know. I really loved the uh, driving off in the convertible. I thought that was great. That was. I have actually been preparing for this all night long, and I didn't see any of it. So. <laughs> I hate to say I care less, but. Uh. <laughs> oh, you can't say that. <laughs> It, it wasn't, as, as the fighter pilots say, a target-rich environment. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you one thing I saw, and, and um, it was just as one of the limos was driving down the street, and the camera, the TV camera, was in the back of the crowd shooting through the crowd, and there was a young man in the street wearing a cardboard Burger King crown. Nice. Now, there's the money shot. Right there, yeah. <laughs> Barbara, Damon, Adris, thank you so much for spending thank time you. with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. For your photography as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Please do visit our Pulitzer Gallery. I mean, the images that we're talking about, I mean, that imagery, that, that really does uh, stick with you for a while. Thanks for visiting the museum, and, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> they didn't tell me to stop, but I think... <laughs>